Grab your Bibles and turn with me to the New Testament pastoral epistle referred to as Titus. Tucked in the very back of your Bible there after 2 Timothy, just before Philemon. Today we move from our three-part sermon focus on verse 5 through 9, where Paul commended Titus to the priority of appointing qualified shepherds to lead God's redeemed people. In these next two verses of verse 10 and 11, Paul turns to warn Titus of those who look to upset the sheep by teaching for selfish gain what is false doctrine. Paul's point is clear. These who do this must be silenced. Church, the Lord has appointed in his holy and most helpful written word, the things we need to know and to understand for faith and for life. There is a real, true, spiritual battle that rages right now all around us. Not only do we need to be led and taught by those who glorify God, but we need to not be led and taught by those who do not glorify God. Both are important to rightly understand and then to carry out. And so I'm thankful for what our study of this passage will do to bless us this morning and equip us. And I'm excited to jump in, so read our passage with me. Titus 1, 10 through 11. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Paul stresses emphasis to watch out for false teachers and to silence them because in this area of Crete, as often elsewhere, they were threatened. We saw this, we see this as well in the area of Ephesus where Timothy was shepherding. Paul writes a similar warning to Timothy saying, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths or endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. He goes on in verse 6 and 7, they've wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. I think it's important to recognize, church, that it is not hard for any of us to get caught up in speculative thinking or reasoning, to be carried away or to become captive to testimonies that are not of the Lord, or to be part of self-serving discussions. Our flesh is naturally at war with the Holy Spirit and his word of truth. Galatians 5 makes this clear. Church, this is why we must be so diligent to test all things up against God's word, the blessing that it is to us. It's what we've been saying in the recent weeks, that we should not try to navigate this devil-filled world without a sword. This is our sword. Parents, we should not be trying to lead our children without the help, the, 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 the borders, the, the guidance of the word. Christian, we need the word to correct our thinking, to to grow us and mature us according to what is true. 
We must hold fast to the true gospel of our Lord and not any of the counterfeits that have become so commonplace in our society today. So Paul begins his warning here in verse 10 to say, to highlight, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers. Notice with me that Paul stresses the fact that there are many who are subverting God's truth among God's people. This makes the work of silencing them or even removing them all the more urgent for Titus as an appointed shepherd in that region of Crete. One of the regular warnings we see throughout the New Testament and the New Testament authors stress is the threat of people who speak falsely, attempt to stir division in a way that hurts the body of Christ. And to, and to highlight that the way the enemy does this is to often bring that threat within the church. Paul warns in Romans 16, 17 through 18, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions or create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Paul warns the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 29-30, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Uh, this is some of the most important watching that our local church shepherds must do. And it's not only watching for those who try to get in to harm the flock but, and distort the word, but it's watching for those who are already among the flock, who have become warped in their thinking, self-serving in their reasoning. Paul says they use smooth talk and flattery. So this is why, Christian, you may have a hard time digesting this reality that there are people like this among God's people in local churches. You look around, you say, these people seem so nice. But here Paul emphasized that those who are caught up in unbiblical thinking, propaganda, are often not drooling crazy people. They're nice, they're loving, they're well-spoken, they blend right in. Therefore, masters of deception, for they themselves are deceived. Ones who prove to not be walking by faith, but by the flesh. One of the key evidences of their skewed agenda is that they're not efforting to make peace but are content in division. The opposite of the revealed heart of Christ for the blood-bought family, that there's some kind of fleshly con contentment with division, or even pursuing division. Church, we need not live in fear for these, but we are to be watchful. We're also not to accuse any brother or sister who gets on tilt of having this agenda declaratively, but be discerning, to be watchful for the fruit that is shown over time. Church, it's important that we realize why this is so important. Why is there such a constant charge by the apostles and even Jesus himself to be watchful for this. And it's because, and we need to be reminded of this, this is not our home. We're strangers here. We have been adopted into a new family. We live to serve a new king. Our hope, our prize, our safety, our establishment is not in this.
It's also because we are, every one of us, is at war with our flesh. And so therefore, every one of us is susceptible to believing things that are not true, even perpetuating them, if not corrected. We have to be constantly aware that the church is always threatened. So it's this unique dual thing. When you go to bed on Saturday night, hopefully at a reasonable hour, to get up and be readied for this most important time of our week and to worship the living God together, study his word and serve, practice the one another's. There is a feeling of comfort in gathering with the saints and being with our people. But there also needs to be a keen awareness too. When we do this, we are threatened. And the world doesn't like it. And the enemy doesn't like it. And, and, and it is often that they're coming for us in this setting. And so we must be alert. And not just treat it casually. There is something happening all around you that we need to be more mindful of. The church is always threatened. Sin looks at the door, waiting for a moment of doctrinal or moral carelessness to jump. Some of you might feel at times like your shepherds, maybe some of your leaders, other volunteer leaders here at the church, group leaders, ministry leaders, can be maybe a little persistent, maybe a little picky at times when it comes to what is true or what is righteous according to God's word. Maybe they're bringing highlight to you about an area of concern that they see in your life uh, or practice that seems to have a slippery slope or is not God-honoring. And I want you to know this is out of great love for you, right? It's not that we're earning some kind of like secret patches for some west vest we wear in, 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 in secret rooms, right? None of that. It's love for you. It's heeding God's word to the importance of these things, to love you enough to warn you, to be watchful for you. It is because, as stated here, there are many, who we must watch for, who we must silence even, who speak what is false and cause division. There's just simply too much at stake. And, and hear me, this is not just for your shepherds, as, as is the heightened emphasis in the context, but husbands, this applies to you as the head of your wife. Parents, this applies to you as appointed over the little ones entrusted to you by the Lord. And, and again, it's not just watching for robbers with ski masks or perverts with candy. It's watchful for the little ways the enemy wants to whisper in your ear or the ear of your loved ones your wife, your children, and to do this through deceptive means. So through media, through smartphones, through video games, through commercials, through movies and music and friends and, and culture. Don't miss the important point here. There are many who look to speak falsely and create division among the flock. Do you have this in view 
Or are you all just too comfortable with your routines and therefore maybe naive to the threats, maybe in the ways that they're at work already? Church, we must be alert and go to work, for the day is short. And the spiritual battle is active. For there are many. Many who do what in particular? Look with me at the rest of the verse. For there are many who are insubordinate. First, insubordinate. These are people who are disobedient, even unruly. They don't care to heed the truth of God. To really take it, receive it, and then do it. They struggle to joyfully submit to biblical leadership of their shepherds. But instead, they want to argue. They want to tussle. They want to self-reason to do their own thing. Like an unruly or disobedient child, they kick and scream at the idea of being quiet and submissive. They struggle to listen to or honor the authority that God's put over them in its different forms. Christ in us should cause a real humility that's at work constantly. You know, not just like once or twice a week, oh, I was humble, yeah. Constantly. We're going to see that towards the end of today's sermon modeled so well. He says that they're also empty talkers. Those who must be silenced are also good at saying a lot of nothing. What do I mean by that? They're saying a lot, but nothing is truthful in it. In other words, they're well-worded, they're well-spoken, but their, their talking is not grounded in truth. It's full of opinions and convictions, self-convictions, man-made ideas and perspectives, visions and goals and priorities and self-knowledge. But it's devoid of God's rich truth. This is the TV preacher large majority of them at least, the conference speaker, or even the church preacher who crafts an influential message, well-spoken, well-delivered. Man, nailed it. I'm moved, are you moved? I'm moved. Tells inspiring stories, uses clever Christian ease, but isn't committed to teaching God's word as written is all too quick to move into modern ways of thinking, progressive ways of thinking, somehow calling that better. A great example of this, in my opinion, is the famous TV preacher, Joel Osteen. As a young preacher teacher, I saw quickly his skill at speaking. Masterful, masterful. So well spoken, so smooth, so tight. To woo a crowd with well crafted words, top notch. Very polished, skilled at knowing the buttons to press to get the audience to buy into what he's saying. But what he's saying isn't committed to God's holy word. So much of what he speaks is filled with error, a misinterpretation littered with human reasoning. The gross problem with this is that it is leading astray. People, people are deceived. They're misdirected, influenced, thinking what I believe, what, what I'm thinking about these things is, is Christian, it's, it's God-honoring, and it's not. 
Deception is such a key tool for those who must be silenced, which is Paul Weiss, why Paul lists next that they're deceivers. Those who are good at deception are good at making wrong things sound right, making bad things sound good. Understand, they're not blatant in their falsehood. No, it's disguised. The deceiver, the word deceiver here means a mind misleader. One who seduces another in falsehood. But see that there is seduction with words. They found a way to wander from the truth, but they don't just wander off themselves. They circle back to then try to influence others. Paul calls such people in other passages false brethren. John, if you remember in the second letter he wrote, verse 7, for many, there it is again, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Just like Paul is saying here, those who deceive and distort the truth, the true gospel, are not few, they're many. If you slow down, really think about it, you probably know quite a few people who claim to be a Christian, maybe gone to church a long time, and yet they're deceived for very little to none of their life shows true commitment to Jesus in a biblical way. They, they've fostered up a completely other version of Christianity and have been faithful to it. But here's the thing, Christian, you don't get to give them good merits for being faithful to something that's false. John's emphasis in this second letter of these deceivers going out is a way of saying, if you remember, that they were exposed in the church, so they're, they're now not of us. So these were people who were silenced, who were called out. 1 John 2.19, if you remember, he says it this way, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. They liked to reform until it didn't fit their agenda, and then they walked. The simple truth is, you are not a true part of Christ's church if you do not belong to Christ. If we do not belong to, if we do belong to Christ, if we do belong to Him, then God's word is clear to tell us that we will be faithful. Yeah, we'll slip, we'll slide, we'll sin, but we will repent. We will submit ourselves to his lordship in our lives. Meaning that means I'm not going to get to a crossroad where I say, you know what? It was good, but I, I've got other things in mind now. Or I ran into something that his word's clear, but uh, that will cost me too much, so I'm out. It's a sobering reality that scripture highlights often. We must never forget. And that means there will be people that we thought were of us that proved to not be. People that we spent real time with. I've lived this out. People that I've loved and opened my home to and poured into for years. Prove not be of us. Prove to belong to false things. Promote false things. Jesus says, John 6, 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So that's John's reference to what, what happened of, of many of those who were walking with Jesus, but then reached that threshold and proved to not be of faithful disciples. 
So in all this, it's important that we constantly are seeing this is not special. This is not unusual. This is pretty normal. People come and go from the church all the time. They try religion. They try Christianity. In the end, they prove to really not believe in Jesus, not belong to Jesus. See, no, they will claim to say, I still believe in Jesus. I'm still good with Jesus. But they're doing it on their own terms. How do people get to this place? Likely at one point they enjoyed the company of the believers. They benefited from a season of their life where they were committed to partaking with others in righteousness and putting away stuff that was hurtful, harmful, and doing what was better and fighting less and cursing less and, and honoring, being more honorable. They, they, got, they became part of that. But it's not enough to be a faithful participant, a tender, even to serve. You can't just attend long enough and then get grandfathered in. It doesn't work that way. It's as stark as day and night. You have either died yourself and belonged to Christ You've trusted Jesus with your entire life. And therefore, a blood bought into his family. Or you're not. If you do not believe in Jesus and trust your life to him, then you're not a part of his church. You're not a part of his bride. You're not a part of his body. You remain the Lord of your own life. And your only current hope is that God has ordained to save you. It just has not happened yet. That you are a part of his elect, and yet it is not his perfect time and will to give you saving faith. Every Sunday, therefore, that you attend, every lesson you hear, every interaction you have with the church is going to do one of two things. Either it is a sweet part, a gracious part of God's holy work to give you true and full humility and saving faith in Jesus alone for salvation in his appointed time. I pray it is so. Or you continue to heap a greater dose of God's eternal wrath for all the truth you came to know and all the love you experienced by the beloved and yet still did not Repent of your sin and trust Jesus. This is a true reality, and it is still happening in many churches, including ours today. This is the point. We can't put this off in the margins and go, yeah, somewhere in the world. There's a watchfulness for the many who might be very much among us, who look to be like family. We ate with them, we served with them, we grew with them, and yet they did not trust their lives to Jesus through and through. If they claim to have done that, their lack of perseverance in righteousness and to repent from sin proved otherwise. Because all that God saves, he will not lose. Before moving on, please understand that those who are deceived are not reconciled to Jesus. Their proximity to the church and God's truths is not what makes them a part of God's redeemed people. Saving faith in Christ alone does. Also, those who are deceived look to deceive others, and that's why Paul is telling us that we have to identify and silence them so they don't hurt the true family of God. Peter speaks to this too in 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. False prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. 
It's an important thing for us to understand in today's day and age. Because we live in an era whereby people are taught to be open to other people's ideas and views. And you're shamed if you don't. And so in that is, is a great weapon for the enemy to get people to buy into what is not true. Because it makes you embrace it casually. Make nice with it. The other thing to realize about today's society that is so major, so, so, so major, is that we live in a very plugged-in system whereby the many, we talk about many, have a platform now. They have a microphone. They have an audience. They have a following. All too often by actual Christians. to speak publicly in a way that they once did not have. And they're using it strategically to foster deception and exploitation with false testimony and unbiblical worldviews. So th this means faithful shepherds, faithful churches, will always have people who are trying to megaphone why these are bad people in bad places. Right? It, it, we just read it. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. So we need not be surprised. We should actually expect it. Faithful churches, faithful shepherds will have people speak, scream loudly about, with false words, about whatever their beef is or issue or whatever, their accusation. And what's unique about today's day and age is those people get big microphones through virtual media to espouse such nonsense. And so you have to be mindful of even how you see that. Faithful shepherds who have long-standing proven to be remaining qualified, proven to be committed to the word and not to their own agenda are under attack right now in active ways. If you go look for it, you can find it. That exists out there for me, for this church. As citizens of God's kingdom, as adopted children of God's family, as joyful slaves of Christ who is our master, we need to be mindful to be in tune with and obedient to the truth of God. May the Lord grant us discernment to identify the deceivers and not give ear to them. I mean, well, I'm going to come back to this, but that's part of silencing them. It's not necessarily figuring out a way to take the microphone out of their hand. It's not tuning in to the nonsense. Turning it off, putting it away is how you silence their noise. Right? Put away the curiosity. It's toxic. Next, he says, those who are referred to as the circumcision party or the Judaizers. These are Jews who were boisterous about pressing on others their Jewish legalism, unbiblical authority, unbiblical rules, laws, man-made traditions, and keeping old covenant law and putting it on people. Referred to as circumcision party because one of the big things they espoused was you had to be circumcised to be part of God's people. The new covenant is the promised fulfillment that we are now under. Therefore, the old covenant is not. It's fulfilled. Acts 15.5 speaks of these. Some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them in order, to, in order them to keep the law of Moses. We see it all throughout. 
we see the arguments. We see where Peter gets caught up in some of this. Paul has to correct him in other places in the New Testament scriptures. Scripture is clear to teach that those belonging to Christ are no longer under the law, but under Christ. Historic records reveal to us that many Jews lived in this island of Crete. Therefore, the circumcision party, those saying you had to be circumcised to be part of God's people, were heavily at work in this area, which is why Paul is giving special mention of them to Titus. Listen with me to verse 11 to what must be done with these. He says they must be silenced. Silencing someone can be the act of actually taking their microphone away or escorting them out of the building. But it also can be the simple unplugging, unsubscribing from their rhetoric in places where they perpetuate it. It can be turning it off, putting them away, no longer listening, no longer giving them an audience. Those who were teaching falsehood in Crete were likely not doing this in worship services or in the formal church gatherings. This perpetuation of falsehood was likely happening in homes where the sheep were potentially more susceptible to being led astray as the, all the elders were not in every home, right? Not always present to watch and protect against false teaching. But that doesn't mean it still wasn't a priority for these early church pastors to be looking out for, identifying and silencing those who were promoting false doctrine among the brethren. They had to recognize that the deceivers were getting to the sheep in a variety of ways. And again, church, how much more true is that in today's society with the onslaught of publication through its different means, all the Christian books, quote unquote, and podcast and, and videos streaming and TV broadcast means a real demand on us to be that much more diligent and aware of where falsehood is being taught in deceptive ways. Again, this is a regular warning for those Paul was counseling in the different churches. He said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.14, not to quarrel about words which does no good, but only ruins its hearers. Christian, we need to be careful how much debate we enter into, right? What a victory for the enemy when, when your flesh gets riled up and you get sucked into some online Facebook debate that 30 people are watching and it's consuming your day. Second Timothy 3, 6 through 7, among them are those who creep into households. They capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, never able to arrive at knowledge of the truth. We see the various ways that those who look to get to the church use these different means. The enemy is constantly at work, looking to gain a foothold into the church, into the beloved. So, Paul stresses to Titus here, they must be silenced. Why? Since they're upsetting whole families. Paul saw the detriment that these false claims, false teaching, false allegations, false narratives, false gospels were causing church families. He is a shepherd of God who loves God's people, so he took this seriously. As should we. His pastoral heart conveyed to Timothy, says in 1 Timothy 6, 20-21, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. There's so much at stake here, church. We must pray. We must be watchful. We must be diligent. 
They must be silenced, he says, since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain. When Paul says they're teaching for shameful gain, he's highlighting the sinful motives of false teachers or deceivers. This is the opposite, notice, the opposite of the character of a qualified elder that he just got done highlighting so eloquently in the prior verses. Peter, in another place, speaks to it well, that the qualified elder, pastor, teacher, is to shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Sadly, church, charlatans and false teachers have wooed their audiences to lining their pockets with cash and perks for generations. Instead of looking out for the sheep of the flock, these false teachers are preying on the sheep of the flock for their own shameful gain. Godly Godly leaders over God's people instead sacrifice for the good of those they lead. They give up much. They don't prey on them. Another version of this that I've seen creep into the modern church that I want to help you tune into in the last couple decades is how self-promoters have used the vehicle of the church to make a name for themselves so that they can then capitalize on it. All this is cloaked in what seems like a very innocent and true intention. In my early years of being part of the church growth era, I was even kind of groomed to think that this is a way you grow a big, healthy church. This is a way you make a way. For many years in my youth, I had to fight the thought that my own self-promotion wasn't for the good of the people. Like, that's, that was the thinking. This ultimately is going to be for your good. And there's deception even in that. And the way the flesh can grab hold of it, having to really make war with the, the small underpinnings of that, to be humble instead, to, to, to no longer want to be known To no longer see that a successful pastoral career is to be known, is to have authored all these books, is to be recognized all over the place and listened to all over the place. One of the biggest reasons why churches promote their videos is because those pastors are looking for promotion. I get it. And you want the good word to be out there. So I get how the underpinnings of that seem good. My personal conviction And in making war with that whole idea is that people need to be in church. You give them videos and they'll never come. It's the reminder of the reason why we don't publicly broadcast our service. We record it. We broadcast it privately only to our faithful members who are sick or on a rare traveling occasion. Love to you who are tuning in. Get well. Self-promoters have used the church as a vehicle to build notoriety for themselves, to capitalize on it. And the sad thing that I've watched now over the last couple of decades is how many of these quote-unquote celebrity pastors end up becoming disqualified that it's revealed that they are arrogant and therefore disqualified. They are lording over those entrusted to their care and disqualified, abusing their power and disqualified. Too many have reached this kind of stardom and financial success in Christian circles to become disqualified, exposed, removed from the church, or in their arrogance, they abandon the church and go start a new church to find another circle to run in where there is no accountability. 
And the temptation is real. One of those who got caught up in this, who I believe is not qualified to continue to be shepherding, for he shirked real accountability to go find a different group, a different way to prop himself up, is now back at it, and the videos are streaming, and it is everything we're seeing here today. Even as I caught it recently again, man, this guy is good. It's good. Remember why it was so captivating. A lot of good things are being said here. But there's deception. This all is not honoring the Lord as it should. These two must be silenced. They, they must not be listened to. It doesn't matter how much good is amidst the bad. No matter how smooth, helpful, Potent their message may seem, it's not God glorifying. Again, let me highlight that these guys are great at deception. And I believe many of them truly are trying with good intentions. They don't see how they themselves are deceived. Sadly, they've removed themselves from circles of accountability that could help them. They're not operating in a humble way. May the church be led and not influenced by self-promoters. I had a marketing career before being a pastor. Again, I had to work really hard to put away a lot of what makes you effective at marketing. And it took a long time for that to die. In some ways, those of you who know me best know I'm still fighting it. Pray for me. Thank God as I get older, I long at the end of this whole thing to be known as having been a faithful local church pastor, preacher, and that's it. And I didn't need to be known outside of this family. This was my post. You are my people. This is where God gave me to preach and to make disciples to his glory, so be it. We need to not be influenced by self-promoters, but by Christ-promoters. Amen? Ones who are saying, look to God, glory to God. Not men who are saying, look at me. No, look to Christ. Look with me to Christ. We need to be much more like John the Baptist, one of my favorite in all of Scripture, the one who Jesus said is the greatest man to have ever lived, not because of crazy notoriety and great fame and riches, but because of this particular part of his testimony that he did everything he could do to make it about Christ and not himself. Consider his testimony with me by reminder for a moment this morning. John 1, 19 through 20, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews and the priests and the Levites from Jerusalem were sent to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Here comes the top guys in the game. The biggest media outlets are showing up to stick the microphone in his face because what what he was doing was successful. And here's his chance to say, look at me. And he does everything he can to say, I am not I am not the Messiah. He doesn't sell out. He points to Jesus. John 1, 27, even he who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This is a massive statement. The feet of grown men in that day were the filthiest things in all of society. And he's saying, in all this success that I'm a part of, I am not worthy to hold That man's sandals. That's that's my position here. I'm not even worthy to be that Jesus' lowest slave. I'm a simple man who's been called to point to the one deserving the spotlight. I'm one voice in a big land, a very lost land, saying, 
Get ready. The Messiah is coming. Hope is coming. The one who can save us from ourselves, save us from our fleeting pursuit of our own fame. Freedom's coming. He's saying, I'm just a little nobody of a man. The one I get to point to is the holy God. He's everything and I am not. I'm not even worthy to hold his shoes at the door. Don't don't mistake me for him. I'm not the Messiah. I I love, I've thought about it this way. This is John's way of saying, my name is I am not. His name is I am. And, and I've said before, that will preach. And, and that's worth really slowing down to contemplate, church. Because we need it. We need that reminder. We need it when our brothers and sisters around us are saying, hey, make this about you. What, what about us? Look how hard we're working. That's what happened. John's crew came up to him in John 3 and said, Rabbi, he who was, across, who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, is baptizing, and all are going to him. They're, John's crew is going, we're working so hard, and all of our work now is going over there. They're concerned with reaping the reward. I mean, if we're honest, isn't this, is this not us? I work really hard. I want my due. Always comparing, always worrying about getting left out, always feeling gypped, feeling like we're working so hard and yet not recognized by others, trying so hard to hold on to our stuff, our status, trying to get a leg up. But John's heart is revealed. Listen, it's the gross opposite of the man who's looking to make it about himself. The man who's chasing shameful gain. John answers, John 3, 27 to 29, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. I get to be his bride. I get to know him. That's my prize. None of this other stuff that I'm chasing matters. I get to point to Jesus. And when I'm saying, when he says I get to, he's saying that's all I need to. That's my privilege. That's my purpose. And so to make it so clear, he says very famously to his crew in John 3:30. He must increase and I must decrease. Our lives are to make much of Christ and to build his kingdom and not to make much of ourselves and build our little kingdoms. He must become greater and we must become less. We don't need the temporary accolades. We don't don't need to keep up. Why? Because I have Jesus. Amen? Amen? They must be silenced since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what ought not to be taught. The, the, the simple truth is that there are many who teach what ought not to be taught. And I would just ask you this morning as we begin to wrap up, are you listening to these kinds of people? Are you naively turning into, tuning into or believing their message? Is that bringing controversy? Is it bringing division among you and your brethren? Watch out for those signs. Who are you listening to? Who are your kids listening to? What are they being taught at school, in their education, by coaches, by mentors, by friends, by their interactions on platforms? There are too many longing to promote their agenda, and it's false. If you remember back to the letters of John, John warned of the anyone's. 1 John 2.27, you have no need that anyone should teach you. 
Be careful of the any ones I said in that sermon. These are the people who are out there with something to say. Just because someone has something to say doesn't mean they speak truth or that they center on Christ or that they even truly love you. So we vet who we tune into, especially in the name of Jesus, the books we read, the podcasts we listen to, the people we watch. Be mindful, be vigilant, be picky about what you read and what you watch. Help us help you to vet it. There's too many out there. Good, loving, nice people, good intentions, smooth rhetoric. Wow, that was so clever. Wow, that really, man, that one just gets it. And it's just tweaked with falsehood. These are the anyone's. You have no need that anyone should teach you. No, you need biblical teachers who are teaching you the truth of God's word. Gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes." God's word is clear. The church needs teachers, but it needs shepherds who teach God's word and nothing else. These must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that these shepherds can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Recognize that verse? Last week's sermon, Titus 1.9. As we wrap up this portion of Paul's letter to Titus, see with me the high contrast between the qualified pastor, elder, and false teachers, deceivers, self-promoters. We need to heed this warning and not forget it. We need to not play light with those looking to wield influence on our lives. We need to hold fast to the truth and protect those from the enemy's ploys. We need to praise God for his work in and through Christ to bring us to himself, amen? Amen. We need to praise God for his work to raise up and appoint faithful, humble, sacrificial, godly shepherds. We we need to see the example of John the Baptist and join him in a lifelong effort to die to ourselves and live to Christ, to grow in decreasing so that he is increasing. The light on him is bright. God can and will do this in his adopted children. By his grace and for his glory, may it be so. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this time in your word to do business with this appointed warning, instruction to to be dealt with, to be happening. Um, It's for our good. I pray that we'd see it to be so. I I'm excited about the ways that the Holy Spirit's at work in many today in ways that we can't see in each other, in ways I can't see, that we just trust you, Lord, that you're active. Any person here that's feeling uh, uh, a level of discontentment of what about me, of thinking about where is this fit for me, to, to really trust you, the living God, your word, to do its work in us in its good and right time. Be glorified. We thank you for the gospel that sets us free. Be glorified in our celebration. Grown men and women and children will jump and scream and shout today for people running around a grass field with a ball. May your blood-bought people jump and scream and shout for you, King Jesus, our Savior, our Master, our King. May you be praised. May you be exalted. May you be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.